uh, not a not a very long chapter, and it's kind of uh, something near to my heart, which is making mistakes. Um, so this chapter is on debugging strategies. Uh, I, have a, I have a couple of issues with it, but it's more like uh, uh, the difference between somebody like Hadley, who is very computer savvy, and somebody like me, who really needs examples to be more explicit. But that, that's been a situation throughout this book, so, and it's interesting to me. Um, so, um, so the outline of the chapter uh, is about finding and fixing errors, using the traceback and related functions, an interactive exploration of errors to track them down. Um, and then a situation when you're debugging code when you are not the author and you can't really, um, you can't do it interactively because it's, uh, it's, it's kind of hidden from view for, for you. And then finally, debugging non-errors uh, warnings, messages, and the like. And uh, at the, to the start of this chapter, Headley has this uh, caveat, you shouldn't need to use these tools when writing new functions. If you find yourself using them frequently with new code, reconsider your approach. Well, I've been <laughs> my, my hallmark of uh, writing code is I write a bunch of stuff and then I see all the errors and then I debug the errors. So, uh, I, you know, good on Hadley, but uh, basically, uh, Debugging is a natural part of my code composition, no matter how unsophisticated it is. And I find myself bumping into all kinds of edge cases. Uh, sometimes it's not even a bug so much, so much as a, a weird thing, like for example, dealing with uh, Spanish language uh, accented characters that will be converted into something and figuring out the correct environment uh, um, uh, argument to or locale argument to get that to play nicely with the other functions. That's an interesting oh. quote. Sorry, I was just going to say that Hadley quote that you pulled out. Uh, I didn't catch that when I read it and I'm trying to think through like what he really means. Like, well, I, like, it's, I guess a longer, it's a longer quote. Let me pull the whole entire quote. So um, what he says is, um, sorry, it's the beginning of the chapter. Um, okay, he says this, and then he says, instead of trying to write one big function all at once, work interactively on small pieces. If you start small, you, you can quickly identify what something doesn't work and don't need sophisticated debugging tools. Got it. Now, so and, like make it, break, break it up and make it modular. Yeah, break it up. Yeah. Break it up. And, and I think this, this also has to do a lot with what Hadley is doing quite often, which is creating new functions. And I recognize that that's been a theme throughout this book. You know, when in, when in doubt, make a function. And I don't really work that way. And uh, maybe because I'm less sophisticated, but typically what I'm doing is I'm starting with a data set using dplyr or other tidyverse commands in a, in a piped workflow. And then so my bugs are not really in a creative creation of a function. They're more in step one, two, three, four of a piped workflow. So um, my bugs are, are more like um, I forgot to make this argument before I went to step three, something like that. Um, okay, so, um, right. And then he makes a quote, has a quote, finding your bug as a process of confirming the many things that you believe are true until you find one which is not true, uh, which kind of reminds me of what was it, the, the Sherlock Holmes uh, quote between what is impossible and improbable. So you dismiss everything that's impossible and then find what's improbable, something like that. Anyway, so recommended resources for finding and fixing errors. Search using Google, which yes, I use a lot. And then I end up at Stack Overflow, uh, which has gotten better over the years, but still uh, the main function of Stack Overflow commenters is to make others feel stupid. I think I think I, I really get frustrated with Stack Overflow. And um, this is why I think something like the R4DS um, Slack that we use is friendlier, more accepting, um, less condemning of errors. I mean, if they're telling you read the document doc documentation that I know how to read. I need to solve an error. I don't. I don't need to be lectured to. Um, create a uh, reproducible example, and we've seen this a lot in the Slack. Um, create a minimal example that reproduces the error, and often that can help you focus in on what's going wrong. 
And then uh, find where the error is, which is if you've got a long uh, string of code, you have to find a way to go through systematically to locate where the error is occurring and then fix it and test that it's, it's uh, uh, working, that, that you've repaired the error. Um, so locating errors, um, the uh, traceback function uh, can be useful to identify where is the step causing the error. And uh, this is the example from the uh, chapter that Hadley wrote. And this is the sort of example that really um, kind of drive, drives me nuts. Um, and again, I think it's, a, it's, you know, people who are computer savvy, they're just used to this. They're used to um, functions with uh, anonymous names and anonymous functions it has examples, and this to me is not a real world example. Um, but anyway, it's what Hadley presents, uh, four different functions, F, G, H, I, which each call each other. Finally, I demanding a numeric argument. If it doesn't have a numeric argument, it throws a, a, an error. Um, and then um, I've commented it out, but if we call F, uh, F function with A as a character, it's uh, eventually going to go to, um, I throw the error. And if we use the traceback function, which um, let's see if I, um, let me share the RStudio screen. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, if we go to here and see what it looks like. So I'll uncomment this because it's, it, it wrecks the, uh, it, uh, and of course I'm doing this in um, Markdown. But if I run this here, uh, we hit this error D must be numeric, and then we have the show, tr show trace back option. And if I hit show trace back, it'll go from bottom to top, the series of calls, and eventually at the top will arrive at what is throwing the error. Okay. So, and there's also something called uh, rerun with debug, uh, which is supposed to show up here, but I think I, it's a difference. I'm, I'm doing everything in Markdown. I'm not doing it in a script window. And I think that might be the difference is a script window and a Markdown window. So I think I'm he not comments sure. that somewhere in the chapter, right? But Markdown I, is a different debug yeah, uh, in our yeah. studio. Right. Our, yeah, I think so. Our Markdown is different. And so we don't have that rerun with debug. Um, but uh, it is, I guess, uh, and I, I stopped using standard scripts a long time ago. So that's just, uh, I don't have that option. Um, so I'm sorry, going back to, yes. Okay. And then he mentions an uh, issue with lazy evaluation, which is to say that um, uh, sometimes when you're using traceback, uh, it'll linearize the call tree such that you've got a bunch of things that are being included in the call tree that are not really relevant to where the error is occurring. And um, you can get past that with using Arlang uh, commands with abort or last trace, and they will help to condense the tree and focus in on where the error is occurring. He has a couple of examples of how that works in the chapter. Um, so um, uh, one nice function that is described there is an interactive debugger, which is the browser function. So browser function uh, you can insert browser uh, into your function and it will uh, run and pause at that point and uh, tell you what is going on in your environment. Sorry, the dogs are going crazy here. Um, it'll tell you what's going on in your environment. And in fact, the nice thing about browser, it tells you intermediate values of, uh, uh, you know, objects and such. So you can kind of, you know, do a quick uh, view and say, okay, that value is not what I'm expecting that thing to have at this point in the and and you can put the browser function at uh, you can you know, stepwise put it at different points into your function to figure out what's going uh, what's going wrong. So it's just a sort of systematic a way to be systematic about attacking your your uh, where the bugs are. Uh, and there are options in the toolbar. So when you run browser, it actually opens a toolbar uh, in your console or not the yeah, a separate tab in the console window, a browser uh, window, and it has a menu at the top, uh, a toolbar that includes uh, uh, advancing to the next step, uh, also, uh, also using step, which is like next, but if you go, it goes into a function, it'll step into that function. It won't just it'll automatically run that, that function. 
uh, finish or F will finish the current function. And uh, continue is what you'd use if you've made a repair. So you've, uh, you, you leave the debug debugging and then continue the, fu the function, make sure it's going okay. Uh, and then stop or Q, capital Q will quit, returns to the global workspace. Hey, 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 stop doing that. Oh, we, got a, we got a new dog. She's, she's wonderful except when she's not. Um, and um, we found, and, she, and she dug up the herb garden today. I, I love her to death and, except when she dug up all the herbs. I'm, I'm a little bit pissed off about that. Anyway, um, uh, enter, uh, which Hadley says he turns off because he, he, he'll inadvertently repeat the previous command, which he doesn't want to do. And there's an option to um, turn that off uh, uh, when using browser. And then where is similar to trace back, it gives you a series of steps of what, you know, what is being run and perhaps where the problem is occurring. Um, and then he mentions alternatives to browser, um, installing breakpoints. And again, I don't think breakpoints really work in our markdown, but they work in our script. And uh, what you can do is click on the left of the line where your command is and install a breakpoint there. And um, uh, then that will uh, give you a pause at that point. And again, you can use that to systematically figure out what's going wrong. Um, there's also a, a, um, a command called options error equals recover. Um, right, and so uh, when you use that, um, you, you get an interactive prompt that shows a uh, trace back right away. And then finally, debug is similar to browser. Oh, I'm sorry, so I, I actually, I, 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 so, okay, so breakpoints, yes, um, so, sorry. Here we go. So yes, uh, uh, doesn't work in, uh, breakpoints don't work in Markdown, they work in a script, behaves like browser. Uh, there are certain unusual situations where it will not work and it cannot, the breakpoints cannot be made conditional. So you, if you have a breakpoint, it's always going to pause at that point. Okay, options, error equals recover. Uh, you automatically see an interactive trace back and then you turn it back off with options, error equals null. And then the third alternative is debug. And what debug does is it inserts that browser function that we saw before right on the first line of the specified function. Um, and if you want to turn it off uh, because it'll, it'll keep going unless you turn it off, you turn it off with undebug or if you don't want to avoid that toggling, you just use debug once to do it the first run uh, for, or the next run, okay? And then um, another option is a utils package set breakpoint. Instead of taking a uh, function name, it takes a file name and a line number as arguments, and then we'll set the breakpoint in the line, num line number of the file name. Uh, one caveat mentioned in the chapter is that the call stack uh, which is to say the series of commands like we saw with, uh, um, with um, traceback, the one, two, three, four, five, the order of those will differ between the different strategies that we've seen. And there's a table in the chapter that will show the different types of call stacks, but just be aware that the call stacks will not be identical for each strategy. Uh, finally, in this section, what is mentioned is that if you are uh, uh, adept at uh, uh, C or C++, you can dig into the compiled code and, de and debug in that. That is not a topic for this chapter. However, he do, there are uh, several links to resources that you can use if you are of that um, caliber of being able to debug. Okay, now uh, uh, part five has to do with non-interactive debugging. And this is where you uh, the code is not really um, available to you. Uh, it is uh, sequestered somewhere else and you're trying to figure out what's going on incorrectly without being able to have full access to the code. And so the uh, advice is to check some rather basic ways in which code can break. Uh, look at the global environment and see what the differences are between the global environment uh, you're given and what you expect. Also look at differences in names of packages or package versions. Uh, check to see in the environment if there are objects left there that perhaps are, you know, were created before and now are interfering with the workflow because the, uh, the, what the, the, the value or the character, uh, the class of the object is interfering with what the um, script is expecting. Check to see that you're in the 
working directly, directory you're expected to be. Check your path environment variable to see uh, um, uh, how the, what the path is, what is being called. And then finally, check the R li R libs environment variable, which is where R is looking uh, using the library command. Where is it looking for packages? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when you're doing non-interactive debugging, uh, a strategy that can be used is what's called dump frames. Dump frames is sort of the uh, recover for non-interactive code. And it's a sort of, they call it a sort of a cheat in that what you're doing is creating a file called last dump RDA that you can then, uh, oh, I'm missing a quotation mark there, uh, but you load and then call debugger on that. And so it's a way to kind of recreate the call stack in your local environment and see where things are going wrong without actually getting access or get, having the code uh, available to you. Um, okay, and then um, uh, a strategy that is mentioned, uh, and it's actually something I, I've used cons uh, consistently, it's called uh, um, primitive but functional, okay? Yes, it's primitive but it's functional, that's all I care about. Uh, using print statements to print values, so just uh, throwing in a print into your function or your flow and it's similar to what we were seeing with browser, but you're basically saying, okay, at this point, tell me what this value is. And um, I've used this uh, frequently when I'm trying to figure out where things are breaking down. I'll throw a print in and say, or especially in something like a, like a, a, a map or what I used to use a for loop. Uh, I mean, for, uh, for loops would always break on me and I couldn't figure out why. So I started to just throw in print into the for loop. And that would tell me, oh, wait a second, I'm I'm uh, I'm in a loop. I'm 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 in a, a perpetual loop, or my value isn't advancing, or something is breaking. And um, it's just a way to be explicit, you know. Instead of letting it run, having it break, and say what's going on, you're returning to the console a series of of uh, values that are basically checks on what you expect to see. And if if you don't see it, then quite often it's like, oh yeah, I forgot to iterate by one, something like that. Okay, and it gives an example here, which is a little bit cut off, but anyway, you can see that it's returning the value of B uh, in, the, in an intermediate phase to tell you what is the, uh, that uh, uh, print, what is the value of B in the function G, okay. Yeah, that, the uh, print stuff, I was just gonna say the print stuff is like all I did and did before reading this like i every yeah. time you know like yeah. um and uh i always leave like print statements in by accident and then you like yeah. run it a bunch of times and it's like <laughs> you know like yeah. it's like oh i yeah. printed out i printed out 10 data frames great like <laughs> i mean I, re I really think there's no su uh, substitute for explicit values coming back i mean I, that way I, I'm, I'm kind of that way. I, I can't kind of imagine. I have to see it on the screen and I say, wait, there it is. It didn't happen. Oh, so, yeah. Um, now with our, our markdown, uh, and this is something I, I hit my head against often now that I'm almost always using our markdown is the environment, um, which is uh, I don't like to have to recreate an object or a data frame or something in the R markdown environment. But if I, if I hit the knit button, and it's not creating that object, it throws an error because our markdown is always starting from scratch. Our markdown is not assuming that you have things in the environment that may not be there for another user. And that's a, that's a feature, not a bug, uh, to make our, our markdown reproducible. It expects you to recreate your objects in the session. If you want to avoid that, use our markdown render and then the name of your file and that will avoid the problem that comes with the knit, pro the knit button. And then there's this thing called sync. Uh, sync will uh, remove the output caused by knit R. Um, and um, it's, it's kind of analogous to recover. So, uh, so in this case, um, uh, yeah, so, so, there's, so knit R has this default sync that it uses to capture output. And if you want to get past that, you use the sync command 
to avoid that. And then uh, it'll generate a warning, which is no sync to remove, but that's not a problem. Um, okay, and finally, uh, non-error failures. And these have to do with uh, warnings and me messages that we're familiar with. If you want to turn those into errors, you have options. Uh, uh, so if you get a warning and you think it's problematic, you, do, you would prefer not to see that warning uh, because it is indica indicative of a problem even though it's not breaking your code. You can use options, warn equals two, turn that into an error. And the same with messages. And you use rlang with abort to turn messages into errors. Um, bigger problems are when a function does not return. So you run the function and it just is in limbo. You want to use traceback to figure that out. Um, and then finally, if R crashes, that indicates an error, an error in compiled code. So basically it's crashing at the C or C++ level and something more, um, more fundamental is wrong. Uh, and uh, it affects, um, yeah. So basically, uh, so your options are trying to make a reproducible example. Uh, if it has to do with uh, dealing with a package and you cannot figure it out, maybe you contact the uh, package developer. Um, of course, we all use Google and uh, Slack and such to uh, try to get past that when possible. Um, and I think all of us who have this experience uh, in the Slack channel, both asking questions and trying to answer questions, we're pretty familiar with what constitutes a useful example, a useful question, and what is kind of like, um, hey, could you give us more information? So um, that's about everything. Yeah, that's the end of the uh, what I've got for, um, for debugging. As I said, it was a pretty straightforward chapter, but one that uh, I enjoyed going through. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Uh... Uh, awesome job. Um, yeah, does anyone have anything I'd like to discuss more? Um, I, uh, yeah, does anybody have any preferred strategies that they use or, or things that are not covered here that you find useful? I was just going to say, I started after reading this, I started using uh, browser a little bit. Um, yeah. And I really like it. Like, just it's so powerful to be able to like see what all the objects in the functional environment look what their current state is at, at a given point in time um i the only thing i wish it could do is like actually like be able to explore that object like i couldn't figure out how to do that like if i wanted to like see like the last row or something oh of, you you of can't the, the last, okay i couldn't figure out how to like do anything in the in that like mode like it just like the script is like read only and then the and then the console is like um go next like press enter to go to the next one or whatever and like so there's no space to maybe you can like export it or something but there's no space to like do that i wish i think that would like give it a little more power but it's still pretty cool i like that Yeah, I haven't used the browser before. I was thinking about using it on some of my uh, bug filled code, but haven't got around to it. Um, I use probably the similar stuff that you do, Mike, which is a lot of um, you know trace back. And if you can see something obvious, then fix it. Google things and uh, occasionally use print statements where I have to. Um, but I think to the Hadley's point about like making your code smaller or more functional, that's been kind of the big change I've started to do. Um, in the last year, more of my code I've tried to push into smaller chunks just because that way I can avoid some of the bigger pitfalls. Like right now I'm working on a set of code that is quite monolithic and I wrote it quite monolithic because I started it more than a year ago and rewriting it, I'm like, why did I do this? I should have made a bunch of smaller sub functions and everything would be cleaner. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's it. But um, in conjunction with the other people's code, I think that one, I don't know if it's that easy to solve ever. I've had definitely had the problem of two things named the same thing or you know your environment's expecting a variable that it wasn't. Um, 
but rarely if ever I run into problems with versions of uh, like model building where it's just totally like somewhere in their code, something breaks that you just, you don't expect and you can't fix and you have to go and you find like five uh, GitHub requests from someone for it to be fixed and it's never, never, <laughs> never is. So, you know, um, yeah, I think that's my main experiences. I, I think what you're describing about monolithic code, um, our markdown has really helped me get away from that because when I would work in scripts, there's not a natural breakpoint in scripts and I could comment it, but in general, I wasn't seeing boundaries, but with the chunk set up in our markdown, I find that a very convenient way to sort of segregate uh, different, uh, um, uh, different roles, uh, you know, different, different things. And, and I, that way I can comment in the chunk, I don't need to run this again. Uh, or this needs to be updated and that, you know, that to me is, it, I just really like a modular sort of format of our markdown. Yeah, I, so I've been using our markdown more in the last year and I usually use it for analysis. Um, so like if I'm building a report to describe something uh, or, you know, some research, but uh, for model building, I'll usually, or something has to be run in line on like a Dockerized container usually those sort of things I will build in a script. Um, but one thing I found with the, with Markdown is sometimes I'll actually build models or data or pieces of data that I'd be running every time at the top of the Markdown. I'll build that in a script somewhere else and then just source the output. So like the R files or our, our data in, because I know I'm going to be using it over and over and over again, and it's stable. So maybe that's cheating, but that's, that's one of the ways I've been using Markdown. There's no cheating. There's no plagiarizing. Everything's there. Yeah, I remember uh, watching like the Tidy Tuesday videos like for the first time like a while like a while ago uh, with like David Robinson, and then he was saying that everything he just starts in an R markdown, like everything he does, he just starts it there because like and I and and I just thought it was such a at the time I was like this is transformative, like you know. Uh, uh, like if you like write kind of what you're doing along the way and then you like do a bunch of stuff and have output, like you kind of have like a, a first draft of a report um, already done, you know, without having to like do another copy of it. Um, so that was pretty cool. This just makes me think what you're saying, Josh, is there a way to like turn a R markdown file into R script like easily, like to get rid of all the markdown stuff, like and just keep the, um, I was just thinking in like Jupyter notebooks, you can say like save as like a Py file or like a Python mm -hmm. file and like get rid of all the, and it like, it'll like still have the headers and stuff and it'll like have some notation where you have like, like chunks, but you like, but you can just like run that with Python and it doesn't have, give you any errors. I just wonder if there's something like that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, but I, I would imagine you could do the same thing because you could just comment out all of the things that aren't our and then put the chunks sequentially. Yeah, I'm just looking now if you can like, like export it in a certain way. I don't know. I'm sure that's not the way they really want you to use our <laughs> markdown. Yeah, probably not. Um, yeah, I was gonna say too, the, the uh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead, um, go ahead. Uh, that uh, I've had all these cases where, um, where they have those environmental conflicts with like packages loaded and it just drives me nuts. Like, like I'm using like select and, and like, and it's like, can't select uh, like a value, cannot locate value called like, it doesn't do the, the tidy evaluation. It doesn't yeah. know that it's like a closure or whatever. And uh, I just like, I've looked, I've like wanted to like, just throw my computer out the window and like, what filter doesn't work? Like what the heck, <laughs> like what's wrong with it? And there was a, I, I would think for a little while I was like, using, I don't know, there's something like about spatial stuff I was doing and like, and like it had the function map in it. And uh, so, like, this is it just, that's kind of thing just drives me crazy. Like it's so annoying. Yeah. I don't write um, select, I write dplyr select every single time. Mm. Wow. Because, oh, I, really? because, yeah. uh, because I inevitably have some other package loaded that's causing that's chaos. Terrible. That's good practice. That's terrible. terrible. Yeah. It's the only one I make sure to do it for, but yeah, I've run into that problem so many times now. It's just second nature to do. 
Yeah. Uh, getting yeah. To, Kevin, what you were saying about um, you know uh, our markdown uh, being transformative, it's it's an interesting experience to me. You know, being an educator here at the university, and uh, I deal with the grad students, and I really try to push them toward our markdown because this is the way. You don't have to go from Word to Excel and blah blah. You you know you just do everything in one workflow and generate your document, and they're thrilled by it. But faculty cannot be bothered to learn something new. <laughs> you know, whatever they learned 20 years ago, they're still using. And they're oh, I, I don't need the, something new. You know, you, you say you could have your data frame and your graph right into in an HTML document, generate a PDF, whatever. No, 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 I don't have time to learn that. So. Well, they, and they could write like APA papers with. Like, exactly, exactly. And I, I, and stuff I've said, right in there. I'll do a free tutorial anytime you want. Nobody will take me up on it. I have grad students who are just like, this is great. But faculty, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we um, have uh, interns. I do the same thing. I'm like, just everything you're doing, it do it in Markdown because that's going to be the easiest way to turn it into a paper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the most annoying thing when I was like, uh, like in the education research world with papers was like the last step every time before you like in our world or when I, in our process before you submitted a paper was like checking all the in-text like citations and like if they all met, if like everything in the text was in the, in the, in the site, in the bibliography or whatever you call it. And, and then everything in the bibliography was actually cited in the text. And, um, and I feel like all of these tools like just make that so much easier. I think like latex or like does that pretty well for you, right? Like, yeah. Um, so I mean, to, to set up your bib tech is, is sometimes a huge struggle on its own, but yeah, mm -hmm. go like you, your bibliography, if it doesn't show up in the actual file, the, it doesn't show up in the, in the published bibliography. Yeah. Well, I, the formatting well, I, can be terrible. Yeah. Yeah. One weekend, uh, we were, it was actually for a grant submission, um, and same problem though. And like, uh, we had to like find all the cases where, uh, where that was happening, where there was kind of that mismatch. <laughs> And uh, I ended up writing like an R script over the weekend to like parse the paper and like find all the, you know, parentheses with like a citation in them and like, uh, you know, find all the ones in the, in the bibliography and figure out what the, the last names of the authors were in the year and all that. And like, um, yeah, and uh, yeah, there's better ways. But. It felt like a good use of your time. Well, yeah, I just like, I don't know, sometimes I just like, re I was like, I'd rather spend three hours writing an R script to do something that might take me two hours to do manually. Like I just rather like it, and then I could just do it every single time for every case in the future. Like, uh, I just, that, that, that kind of like, you know, that, that wrote like work is just terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very much the same. I, you know, even if it takes longer, I would rather do it the way I think is the right way rather than cludging through yeah, totally. Um, uh, something else I was going to say. Um, forgot. Uh, I recently became a, a kind of active again in a hobby uh, that a lot of old timers are in. And uh, uh, I found a way to automate my reports uh, you know, for the you know, columns that are written. And I wrote to the editor and he said, hey, I, you know, I've got this, you know, workflow if you you know if you've got to organize stuff I can do it for you in a few seconds. This is well I'm still using a word perfect floppy that my son gave me in 1988. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. It's like okay, I know where we're coming from. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah Kevin I think the the select one is probably the most annoying bug that I've run into. Like that, that one is the one that I, I think I spent the most time pulling my hair out with. Um, Somehow I always forget that what the problem is a namespace problem. Like, yeah, like, like I'm like, does this column not exist? But like, I just referred to it in the previous line, like, and I didn't drop it. Like, yeah, it's happening. It's the worst. Um, trying to think of like other cases where, like, from JSON can get me sometimes if I have um, two different JSON packages loaded up, if it's the mm -hmm. wrong one, 
the list format breaks because it's they don't use the same like they don't separate into the same nested versions of lists and they don't write the same nested versions of lists so like if our data engineer wants like this particular format for this thing i have to make sure that i've i'm using the right like to json and to read some right. stuff you got anyway, it's like so there's things like that where you can run into namespace problems if you have things that are trying to do the same thing um so and, and you load them both in because you're a fool. I think that's uh, that's part of it. Um, yeah. So I guess in like CRAN, they don't like 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 try to anticipate that, right? They're just like they look at each package as like an independent thing. Well, I guess if you try to like write a package that's like has all the same names as fun functions as vplyr, they're gonna like flag you. But um, yeah, I don't know. But they probably don't like exhaustively search for like every you know JSON package or whatever. Well, the, the dplyr uh, select uh, explicit command really is the best workaround. So thanks for recommending that, Josh. Yeah, uh, yeah. I bet the map one comes up too sometimes. For you know, like uh, that's one where map is a very like common uh, verb. So yeah. I, yeah. In other languages too, like with like you know, like map reduce that type of thing. Um, yeah. Um. Uh, do you guys use the warning option much? Like I, I have that problem sometimes where I know it's giving me some bad default values that due to warnings. And so I have to, I change it to errors. I've never done that, yeah. No, in fact, I'll, I'll, in, in our markdown, I'll, I'll toggle warning equals false to turn that off. Cause usually yeah. it's telling me, telling me you have NAs or something like that. I know that already. Yeah, and usually if I'm if I'm creating NAs, you know, like I don't like I know that I'm I anticipate them creating them, but there are occasions where I'm like, okay, this is running through something and it's creating something where I don't mean to, and I've tried to explicitly cause it not to do that. Like, you know, there shouldn't be characters in this in this column, mm -hmm. and then I'll go and I'll try and find the exact uh, instance. So that's maybe you put a for loop on it, and then um, and then turn on warnings uh, options warn equals two. That's kind of the, one of the few times I. We'll use that that instead. Oh so, oh, so you use that regularly? That options. Okay. Um, it's only if like I know, like I, I know I'm getting an error because of a, a warning, and and it's one of those things where I think Hadley had an earlier chapter where it's like, if you have a warning, you know, you really should have an error, you know, mm. or a message. So it's um, yeah. So I have I do use that probably like you know once a month for for some problem. So how are we set up for uh, coming weeks? Uh, I think Josh, you have the next one, right? Yeah, on profile. Yeah, that's what I have down. Measuring performance, yeah, yeah profile. Um, we don't have anyone for the chapter 24 and then I've preemptively claimed 25 because I want to play around with C++ a little bit. Um, Is that the last chapter? 25? That's the last one, yeah, yeah. So three more. What is 24? Uh, it's from improving performance. Uh, so let's see what that is actually. Um, uh, it's kind of interesting, like looking at the organization, your code, trying to make it faster. Um, well, you know what? Um, I'm not going to make any promises right now, but if Josh is doing next week, you're doing 25. Let me take a look at that. I've got a couple weeks. Uh, it is a topic that I find interesting and uh, I don't know much about. Uh, now, if, if uh, Jake or somebody else uh, jumps back in, uh, in the problem, it, uh, well, yeah, that way at least we'll have a plan to get to the end of the book. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, maybe next week we'll just be like, you know, Mike wants to take this one, if, if everyone else is cool with that, uh, assuming everyone else is here next week or Jake is here next week. Um, so, um, yeah, and then we did talk about, like, I don't know, a while ago, like having something at the end where we're, like, putting a little example together, or, uh, together either, uh, like, on our own, I guess, and, like, sharing what we were able to do, on, uh, like, as a summation or, you know, capping off the course. Um, 
so I don't know if we, we could still talk about that. It's a little ways away, but um, I think that'd be cool. I have like a, an idea for what I might do. Um, uh, I might ta try to tackle a translation uh, uh, like from R to, we use this um, uh, infrastructure monitoring tool called Prometheus at work. Um, and we like, it's just like a database, time series database. Uh, and you like get data from it with like a, a REST API call. And so I was thinking you could like, there's like filters and stuff. And like, I was thinking you could, you know, translate R and R like, like tidyverse chain to, to, the, to, to that like call. Uh, I, I don't know, just as an example, I figured I could de dig back into that chapter again. Um, but we'll see if I actually have time to do that. Sounds interesting. You, you guys, I think, uh, are, are, and, and Jake are all uh, more advanced in turn, more ambitious in what you guys are trying to do. Uh, so I'll, I'll look for, I don't know if I'm going to really be able to set up an exercise, but uh, I'm, I'm interested in what you guys create. I mean, yeah, or, or even like, uh, I don't know, like, like bringing some, like finding like some package that uses some of these concepts in an interesting way, or I don't know, like, I don't know, whatever. It, it could be an open-ended discussion at the end. Just, uh, just, I think we talked about it. I thought it was a kind of a neat idea. Um, so we'll see what comes of it but, you know, sure. as we get closer to the end. But yeah. Um, yeah. Well, uh, thanks right. for guys for sticking it out uh, to this point. Uh, still yeah, four. Too. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, okay. thanks, Mike. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. So I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll uh, get the GitHub stuff uh, together. Uh, and so I'm going to sign off now, but thanks for your patience and waiting for me to present this thing. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks so much for uh, your presentation. Are you still going to the thing? Do you still have the other one after this? The uh, stats? I, I posted to them that I'm going to be in and out. I'm not really invested in that so much. And uh but it's still uh, happening. It's like still going. I on. think it's still happening, but it didn't yeah. happen last week, and it didn't happen the week before, which is our studio. So, um, uh, and I don't know. I mean, with this one, we can see the end in sight. I don't know how much more that's got to go. Um, I do kind of feel like, um, especially at this point, with uh, other duties going on, I'm trying not to spread myself too thin, and that's that to me is more expendable than this one. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, we'll have a good evening, you guys. Uh, yeah. See you, see you next week. See you next week. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. See you guys. Take care. Good night. Bye.